thank you for listening to this Calvary Aurora Bible study with Pastor Ed Taylor. We pray as you study through God's Word that you're blessed by God's abounding grace. Amen. Take your Bibles, open them to John's Gospel, chapter 18, where we'll finish off the chapter today in our verse by verse study of John. Jesus has just been betrayed by Judas. Judas brings a detachment of Roman troops into the Garden of Gethsemane. It says in verse 12 of chapter 18, the detachment of troops and the captain of the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. They led him away to Annas first, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. And it was Caiaphas who gave counsel to the Jews, verse 14, that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. And Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. Now that disciple was known to the high priest and went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter stood at the door outside. Then the other disciple who was known to the high priest went out and spoke to her who kept the door and brought Peter in. Then the servant girl who kept the door said to Peter, You are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? And he said, I am not. And the servants of the officers who had made a fire of coal stood there. And it was cold, and they warmed themselves. And Peter stood with them and warmed himself. Then the high priest then asked Jesus about his disciples and his doctrine. And Jesus answered him, I spoke openly to the world. I always taught in the synagogues and in the temple where the Jews always meet, and in secret I've done nothing. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me, and what I said to them. Indeed, they know what I said. Verse 22. And when he had said these things, one of the officers who stood by struck Jesus with the palm of his hand, saying, Do you answer the high priest like that? And Jesus answered him, If I've spoken evil, bear witness of the evil. But if well, why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. And Simon Peter stood and warmed himself. Therefore, they said to him, You are also not one of his disciples, are you? And he denied it and said, I am not. And one of the servants of the high priest, a relative of him whose ear Peter cut off, said, Did I not see you in the garden with him? And Peter then denied again, and immediately a rooster crowed. It was just a few moments earlier that Jesus predicted to Peter that he would deny him. And remember Peter's response as another gospel. We put all the gospels together to get a full picture of these events and these trials. And you remember the response in Mark's gospel was, no way, never, I will never deny you. These, even if everyone is made to stumble, I will not stumble, is a paraphrase of Peter's response. It was filled with self-confidence. He he was very self-confident in his loyalty and his commitment to Jesus. And I believe he was sincere. I believe he really meant it. I believe that he was not just merely trying to place himself in a higher place than the rest of the disciples, but he was passionately expressing his commitment, I will never, ever, never deny you. And just moments later, the rooster crows, and it wasn't but three times he denied him before the rooster crowed. Really, Peter's denial began began back with his denial that all would fall. And we spent a whole week looking at Peter's decisions that led him to backslide away from Jesus. We learned how not to backslide by looking carefully at Peter's life. If you're taking notes, let's just review that quickly in looking at Peter's life, how not to backslide. Number one, Peter was self-confidence when he should have been selfless. Number two, we found Peter sleeping when he should have been watching and praying. Thirdly, we learned that Peter was impulsive when he should have been waiting on the Lord. Fourthly, he was running away when he should have been drawing near. Fifthly, Peter was following at a distance when he should have been following close. And finally, we find Peter warming himself at the fires of the enemy And as they kept asking him and pressuring him, he denied the Lord. He finally broke and turned against the Lord. And his his denial caused him to weep, to go out and weep bitterly. 
The last step of his backsliding and denial, really, we could actually add a number seven that I didn't add, add later um, when previously when we did the Bible study, could add a number seven, and that was Peter just completely went back to what he was doing before. He just went to go be a fisherman, and he, he, he concluded that, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to be able to follow Jesus anymore. There he is dead, and, and after the resurrection... If you go to Israel with us, we'll take you to the area where they say traditionally this happened. But we go there very early in the morning. We try to beat everybody there. We got to get, ex- get up extra early so we can beat everywhere to the side of the Galilee there where the time where G- Jesus comes to the waters and he calls Peter and he begins to restore him and bring him back into a place of service and ministry again. It was a difficult time for Peter. It's in John 21 that Peter's being searched for by Jesus and Jesus finds him and encourages him. Peter does deal with his disappointment. Uh, He is disappointed in himself. Disappointment has everything to do with expectations so that when you and I express a disappointment, what we are expressing is that someone did not meet our expectations. But disappointment isn't just reserved for other people. We can often find ourselves disappointed in ourselves. So let me ask you this question, and I want you to answer it very loudly if you can. Have you ever been disappointed in yourself? Yes. Well, that's good, it's good, because Saturday night nobody answered. <laughs> I certainly have disappointed in myself in a decision that I made or didn't make or something that I said or I didn't say. Disappointment, you know that you're in the realm of disappointment when you start using words like I could have or I should have or I would have. You could start using phrases and hear phrases like, man, why did I do that? Why did I say that? I thought I was a lot stronger than that. I thought I was a lot more mature, a little bit farther along. Why do I feel that way? And disappointment, really the root of it, is because you trusted in yourself. That's a painful realization. The fact that you're disappointed with yourself tells us that you were holding on to yourself. When I'm disappointed in myself, I had high expectations that I didn't meet. I expected more of myself. I expected more of who I am and where I've been and yet failure, failure is common to all of us. And for some of you, God has brought you here today to hear these words. That even though you may be disappointed in yourself, God is not disappointed in you. He doesn't see you the way that you see you. He doesn't put the kind of expectations and pressure on you that you put on yourself. No, the Bible says that God knows us with a perfect knowledge. In the beginning of Psalm 103, the Bible declares that God as a father has compassion on us. In the Old King James, New King James, it says he has pity on us, but I like compassion as a much better translation of that Hebrew word. That God has compassion on us. Why? Because he knows that we're just dust. The problem is, is that we aren't so willing to admit that we're just dust. And we're not so willing to admit that our hearts are deceitfully wicked above all things who can know them. But God, he's not disappointed. He has the perfect expectations on you and gives us the power to fulfill what he expects. And in your failure, you may find God using it in your life. And you might, be, you might find him using it in a very specific way, and that is to bring discipline into your life. Or the old King James word, chastening. Turn over to Hebrews chapter 12, and let's learn a little bit about the chastening hand of God. In the midst of failure and all of the disappointments of life and the difficulties of life, God is using that difficult time as a time to deci- discipline you. A time of chastening, a time of training. Pick up with me in verse 3 of Hebrews chapter 12. 
For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. Often weariness and discouragement are linked to disappointment. So be careful. Keep your eyes on the Lord. Endure with him. Verse 4. You have not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. And have you forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as sons? My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord. Circle that word chastening, just so you know. It means discipline. It means discipline. Chastening of the Lord is discipline. Nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. If, verse 7, you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Furthermore, we've had human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? For they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them. But he for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. And now verse 11 is like the biggest understatement of all in verse 11. Now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. In the message translation, it says in Hebrews 12, 11, at the time, discipline isn't much fun. It always feels like it's going against the grain. Later, of course, it pays off handsomely for it's the well-trained who find themselves mature in their relationship with God. Discipline in and itself isn't meant to be pleasant. If it was, it would have very little power to impart to us the correction that we need to receive. But by its very nature, discipline is very unpleasant to administer and to endure. How many times have you had to say to your kids, parents, or maybe you heard it when you were a kid, where there it is, it's that time of discipline, they're in trouble, and then you say, this is going to hurt me more than it's going to hurt you. And your kids are like, what? That doesn't make any sense. Why don't you hand that paddle to me and let's try that. Let's try it the other way around. Or let, why don't I put you in timeout and we'll see how he feels for you. you know, it, it's, it's hard as a parent. Any parent will tell you it's a hard thing to discipline. For some parents, it's so hard to discipline that they've chosen not to discipline. They've chosen to overlook things and chosen not to deal with things and set them aside. But the Bible says that God loves us and one of the ways that we know he loves us is he chastens us. He disciplines us using our own disappointments as tools in his hands. The times when we were so dependent upon ourselves, God reveals to us, you you can't be dependent on yourself. You can't have those high expectations for yourself. Your life is to trust in me. And yet, although it's it's, it's not fun in the beginning, the end result is always a good thing. We become more mature in the Lord. Peter's going to grow up from this experience. He may think at the time right now that this is the end of his life. He's going to go back and be a fisherman. This whole thing of following Messiah, giving my life to him, dedicating all that I am to him. Look where I'm at now. I denied him. I failed him. I'm a failure. I'm going to go be a... I was a much better fisherman than I am a follower of Jesus Christ. And now he goes back and weeps bitterly watches everything go down and by the time he's done he's back fishing again but he will recover we'll see that at the end of our study in John for the remaining of our time let's look at the trials here we've looked at the two trials now before the Sanhedrin and I'll explain that to you in a minute but let's go on in verse 28 to the end of the chapter and find these trials in John 18 then they led Jesus from Caiaphas to the praetorium It was very early in the morning, but they themselves did not go into the praetorium lest they should be defiled so that they might eat the Passover. Pilate then went out to them and said, what accusation do you bring against this man? They answered and said to him, if he were not an evildoer, we would not have delivered him up to you. Then Pilate said to them, you take him and judge him according to your law. Therefore the Jews said to him, it is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. 
that the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled, which he spoke, signifying by what death he would die. Then Pilate entered the praetorium again, called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Verse 34. Jesus answered him, Are you speaking for yourself on this? Or did others tell you this about me? And Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you to me. What have you done? And Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Pilate therefore said to him, Are you a king then? And Jesus answered, You say rightly that I'm a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I've come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no fault in him at all. Now for you Bible students, between verse 38 and verse 39 is the time where Jesus is sent to Herod from Pilate. Herod, or Pilate is a consummate politician and he really doesn't want to deal with this. And so he says, I find no fault in him, but doesn't release him. Sends him to Herod to see if Herod will take care of it. And that's found in another gospel. Herod sends him back to Pilate. And that's where verse 39 comes up. But you have a custom that I should release someone to you at the Passover. Do you therefore want me to release to you the king of the Jews? And they all cried again saying, not this man, but Barabbas. And Barabbas was a robber. So we have quite a few trials going on. A lot of information in just a short amount of verses. The first trial... The first presentation between, before Annas and Caiaphas was his religious trial. And that was before the group known as the Sanhedrin. If you're writing that down, it's S-A-N-H-E-D-R-I-N. The Sanhedrin. Let me give you a little background. The Sanhedrin was the Supreme Court of the Jews. And was composed of 71 members. Within its membership included Sadducees, Pharisees, and scribes. All were experts in the law, the, the Torah the law of God. They were experts in law and respected men and elders among their community. Any vacancies in the court were filled by the present high priest of the day. Facing, they sat in a semicircle in such a way that each member could see each other as they were hearing the testimony. And facing that semicircle was a group of rabbi students and they would sit there and have the opportunity to, to dialogue and even defend the person that was there. The official meeting of the Sanhedrin was in an area known as the Hall of the Hewn Stone, which was in the temple precincts. And the decisions of the Sanhedrin were not valid unless it was reached at a meeting held in that place. So they couldn't have the meeting anywhere. It had to be in the temple precincts. The court could not meet at night, which makes this meeting illegal. It was unjust and illegal. They couldn't meet at night, but we learn it's very early in the morning when he leaves because the meeting had just done. So they couldn't meet at night and witnesses were to be examined separately. And the evidence that was given must be valid and agree in every detail. Each individual member of the Sanhedrin was to give their verdict separately, beginning with the youngest and going on to the oldest. And if a verdict was the verdict of death, a night must elapse before it was carried out so that the court might have a chance to change its mind in its decision toward mercy. Jesus is being thrown around between the religious courts, the ones that have planned and plotted to take advantage, take him out. He has to sit before them. And then, knowing that they don't, Rome had taken the right of capital punishment away from their subjects. Capital punishment could only be enforced by the Roman government. And the Jewish people, the leaders know this, and they send him where? To Pilate. To a politician. Who at this time, according to history, is already in trouble. Pilate had one responsibility and one responsibility only, and that was to keep the peace. Keep everybody happy and keep the peace. That's all he needed to do is appease the people so that there would be no reports going back to Rome that Pilate wasn't doing his job. Up to this point, history records at least two major uprisings under the leadership of Pilate, which means his job was on the line. This was his last chance. And the last thing he wanted was for the Jews to start another uprising 
and sin were to roam, and not only would he lose his oversight, he could very well lose his life. This is life and death for Pilate. So Pilate examines him and talks to him. As he is asking these questions, notice in verse 30, 29. Notice verse 29. Pilate went out to them and asked what the accusations were. Luke tells us what the accusations were. These false accusations. Luke 23 tells us, number one, Luke, Jesus was being accused of subverting the nation with his followers, which was false. Number two, Jesus was accused of forbidding people to pay taxes, which again was false. The third accusation that came against Jesus was that he claimed to be Christ the King. That was true. Except that it was twisted by them to say that his declaration of being a king was intended to subvert the Roman Caesar and the king on the throne. And it was a complete fabrication of the facts, these false accusations. And one of the things that Jesus teaches us that is very relevant to our lives is Jesus, perfect man, God in human flesh, never committed a sin, even found faultless by Pilate, a human court, did everything right, lived his life the best way a man could possibly live, and people still accused him of egregious sins. He, he did everything right, and there were still accusations. It's so demonic, accusa- false accusations. And that's what the Bible really declares, that the devil is the accuser of the brethren, who accuses us day and night before the throne of God. So, you know, we will never be able to stand uh, in the shoes of Jesus in the sense where we could say, man, we are perfect. We never done anything wrong. We, we aren't. Uh, of course, we've all, uh, all made mistakes. We've all said things. We've all done things. But, but, but you can get to that place sometimes in your life where, where you look at your decisions. You go, you know, I did the best that I could. I, I follow what I believe the Bible to say. And, and I made this decision and I, I walked by faith along this path and still have accusations come toward you. So don't be surprised by them. Don't be surprised by them and neither cave under them. Jesus stood strong and he continued on answering and giving Pilate. He's giving an opportunity to share the gospel with Pilate, really. Notice verse 34. Jesus gives his insight to Pilate's heart. We wouldn't be able to see this, but Jesus is always able to get to the heart. He says, are you speaking for yourself on this or did others tell you this about me? Are you just hearing things? Are you, are you asking me for your own spiritual life or are you asking me for your political life? Is really what Jesus is saying. Are you really interested if I'm a king, Pilate? Are you really interested in what I have to say? Are you really interested in what I've been doing the last three years? Or are you just asking to save yourself? And I love how Jesus is able to do that in our lives. Anytime we are truly opening the Bible with someone and, and helping them with an issue in their life, anytime we get to the core of it, you just know the Holy Spirit is there. Because a lot of times you come looking for help uh, and you might be looking for help or you might even be wanting to give help and, and you fail to get to the root of the issue. And it takes time to get to the root of the issue. If you don't get to the root of the issue, it's going to come back. And it's going to come back worse than it was before you sought help. Like, like you come in and perhaps you're a married couple and you're like, well, we have marriage problems. And, and if we're not careful, we may just discern, well, your marriage problems are, you're, you're not talking. You're not talking to one another. And if we can just get you talking to one another, then everything will be good. But that's not the root of the issue. The root of the issue is pride. Or the root of the issue is arrogance. Or the root of the issue is a lack of repentance. Or a lack of forgiveness. And if we can get to that then man, you'll communicate just fine. But if we just gloss over, that's why there'll be times when you are, when you're in a Bible study and you just feel pricked to the heart. It's a normal Bible study and you wonder if everyone's feeling the same way as you are. But what's happening? God is dealing with your heart. It's not merely in anymore just an accumulation of knowledge now. It's an accumulation of spiritual growth right in the midst of Bible study and all that God has for you. So here he is. Jesus gets right to the, right to the heart of the issue with Pilate. 
And Pilate tells him in verse 35, it's, it's political. Am I a Jew? Your own nation and chief priests have delivered you to me. What have you done? And Jesus begins to speak to him about his kingdom being not of this world. Verse 36 is Jesus really saying, you know, if my kingdom was of this world, we would have already overthrown Rome. It would have been already done. But that's my kingdom is not of this world. And then Pilate asks him straight up in verse 37, are you a king? And Jesus says, yeah, I am. That's why I was born. But that was the confusion. The confusion with the religious leaders of the day, the confusion of those listening. They immediately associated king with kingdom and a kingdom with overthrowing and they can't be competing kingdoms in the physical world. But Jesus in his first coming came to do a spiritual work in establishing his kingdom in the hearts and lives of people. So in a very real way, we know that the kingdom exists on the earth today, spiritually. It exists in the heart and the lives of anyone that is submitted to the king. Where where the king is submitted to, the kingdom is established. And yet Jesus promises even a more fulfillment, a deeper fulfillment of his kingdom in his second coming, where he will literally return to rule and reign for a thousand years. He first came as a lamb, the lamb of God that takes away the sins of the the world. But in his second coming, he'll come as a lion, the lion of the tribe of Judah to rule and reign for all of eternity. Pilate asks a question in verse 38. He said, what is truth? What is truth? Pilate, like many today, was at a place where This question was being answered with all sorts of philosophical ideas. It seems like everyone has a everyone has a definition of what is truth and and has a creed that they live their life by, or a vision, or a vision statement of how they base their family or how they base their life and what truth they base their lives upon. Truth in Jesus' day, by the Greeks, they said that truth was in a worship of many gods. That there wasn't exclusive to just one God. That, that truth was found in reason and knowledge and logic. That was God. To the Epicureans of Jesus' day, they believed in the God, worshiping the God of partying. That was their thing. They had a saying, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. And that's how they lived their life. The Stoics in Jesus' day their definition of truth was to stay away from both extremes of pain or pleasure and and to have a life without emotion. That's truth. Truth is found in the gods. Truth is found in partying or in in an ever-increasing seeking of happiness or the exact opposite, the avoidance of pleasure or pain, which means you're going to avoid relationships and investing in one another which is so much the source of pleasure and pain in our lives as God designed it. Today we have scientists telling us that there's truth in evolution and we have pop culture icons trying to determine through their songs or through their movies defining truth for us. I I was on my way to church last night and in front of me was a SUV with about 10 different bumper stickers on her window. And through each one of those bumper stickers, I could tell what truth she believed in. She was telling me what her deal was. She was communicating to me what philosophy, what philosophy of life that she lived by. And it was more than anti-God in her philosophy. Marie and I were coming in together and our hearts broke for her. How many of us were in a very similar place? Well, we lived by some creed or by some God of our own making instead of truth. The definition of truth is not a what, but a who. Jesus said very dramatically and emphatically in John chapter 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. If we were to paraphrase what Jesus is saying, he's saying, look, eternal life is only found in me. And it comes from my Father. And any other quest for truth, any other quest for life, any other quest for meaning will be fruitless and false because I'm the only way and I'm the only truth. And I'm the only source of... I am life itself. Pilate asks, what is truth? 
and then sends Jesus out again to the Jews saying that I find no fault in him at all. In between verse 38 and 39, I mentioned is the trial of Herod. We sends him to Herod. Herod doesn't want anything to do with this. Sends him back to Pilate. And then verse 39, but I have a custom. Now I find it interesting that John, in his, his writing, inspired by the Holy Spirit, that he puts it like this. If you read it straight through, it says, I find no fault in him at all, but you have a custom. You know, whenever you're talking to somebody and they're, they've got a lot of superlatives and a lot of things, you know, they're like, hey, I think you're the best. I like you. I like what you're doing. I, I like everything about you. But listen carefully after the but, okay? Because after the but is what they really mean. You can catch your own self doing it. Uh, you may find yourself using a lot less buts uh, in life and just saying it like it is. And here's Pilate. I find no fault in him, but I'm a coward and I don't want to deal with this. And we do have that custom. So why don't you guys make the choice? But see, we know you go, Ed, how can you say he's such a coward? Well, I can say it for a lot of different reasons, but one of them is, is that he had Jesus and Barabbas and many other people he could have chosen. But he includes Jesus because he doesn't want to deal with it. And he wants, just like the Jews want to wash their hands of this and blame it on the Roman government, the Roman government want to wash their hands on it and blame it on the Jews. And it was sin that hung Jesus on the cross. You and me. I find no fault in him, but we have a custom. To appease the Jewish people, there was an agreement at the time of Passover to release a prisoner to them. It was intended to be a gesture of goodwill from Rome to the Jews. And Pilate sees this as the opportunity to get out. You know Barabbas' name? You know what it means? It means son of the father. That's what the prefix bar means in the Hebrew. When you see that translated bar, it means son of. And Abbas is a reference to father. He's the son of the father. So here you have the true son of God, the true son sent by the father next to a son of a human father. And they don't choose him. It says that Barabbas was a robber. And we kind of think, well, you know, he's just a bank robber, I guess. Or, you know, he liked to steal stuff. That, that's not the strongest word they could have used. To today, I think what the word we would use in our culture and context today is that Barabbas was a terrorist. He was a zealot. He was an insurrectionist. He was everything that they accused Jesus of times a thousand. He was a murderer, a destroyer of families. So opposite of Jesus Christ. While Barabbas tried to destroy, Jesus came to rescue and save. Barabbas wanted to see God's kingdom, but through violence and force and war and death. Jesus came as a man of peace, bringing forth his kingdom through love, joy, and ultimately his resurrection, while Barabbas was a thief, stealing much more than goods. And of course, verse 19 excuse me, chapter 19, verse 1, the very next verse, Pilate took Jesus and beat him, which we'll get into our time here going forward. Of all the cries of crucify him, crucify him. I find no fault in him. It's always good to stand up for what is right and to take a stand for what is right no matter what the cost is. It's always good to to stay strong in the power of the Lord, especially when you're disappointed in yourself. When you know you, you don't measure up to some of your own expectations for yourself, knowing and being reminded that God's not disappointed in you or me. He knows that we're just dust. He knows that we're weak and frail. He knows you know, one of the things we forget when we're disappointed in ourselves is how far we've come. I mean, look how far you've come. Look what God has done. Look what he has done throughout the years. You know, whether you were born into a a godly family and there's a heritage of godliness that you go to your grandparents and great-grandparents or you're the first generation that's turned their hearts toward Jesus Christ, we, we have to remember what God has done and continues to do, that he's not done with you yet. And that all through these trials, Jesus faced that which was unjust that which was unfair so that you and I might have real life in him. And so God, I I think that uh, 
there, there's so much to glean from this section of scripture. It's a, it's a sterile court scene in some ways, but it's a revelation of your love in so many other ways. A revelation of, of your willingness to not give in, for your willingness not to cave into the pressure. The Sanhedrin caved in. The, the religious rulers that set this up caved in. Herod caved in. Pilate caved in. The disciples left you and abandoned you in your deepest time of need. Peter denied you three times before the rooster crowed. And you steadied on and endured in our place. God, I thank you for sending your son Jesus and for the agony and the pain that he endured on my behalf. It's hard for me to conceive, Lord. It's more than my mind can contain. But I know spiritually you give glimpses. And I know spiritually you, you give us more insight. And today I know there are those leaving that are going to be encouraged. They're going to be encouraged by your love for them. Your promise never to leave us or forsake us. You're going to be encouraged on those that, and I do believe that there are those listening in right now that are on the other end of false accusations. They're kind of being the fall guy for a situation and it's not true. Would you establish them, God, in your truth? Would you be their defense? Would you stand in the gap for them, God? Would you reveal the truth and let it be known? Let let it be submitted to that they could leave today with just a sense of you do work like that. that. That is your way. And our lives might be in the hands of someone else, but truly they're not in the hands of anyone else. They're in the hands of you as your sovereign, providential God who loves us. You gave yourself for us. So Lord, pour over your church a sense of uh, encouragement, the presence of your spirit in our lives, that no matter what we face, God, we can face in truth and in righteousness and that you would get the glory for the great things you have done and continue to do in Jesus' name. Amen. We pray that you've been touched by this study from Calvary Aurora. For prayer or a copy of this study, call area code 303-628-7200. Be blessed this week in the Lord.